There are 41 people on federal death row. Shannon Ogovsky, Texas, 19 years on death row. A heist at the State Bank of Noel on October 6, 1989, made headlines in the little Missouri town. There was no indication of a break-in, but more than $70,000 was stolen. No alarms went off. When FBI agents arrived on the scene, they were shocked to see that the robbers had blasted rounds into a security camera and had taken many sacks of coins, a maneuver not often seen in heists. Investigators believed the offenders were amateurs rather than seasoned crooks. However, there wasn't much evidence at the site for detectives to work with. Finding bank president Dan Short, who lived alone and wasn't picking up the phone, was the detective's first priority. Short was seen by his neighbor being kidnapped by two people and thrown into their brown van in the early hours of October 6th. The 51-year-old bank executive's safety turned into the top priority for the authorities. They eventually tracked down Short's own abandoned truck after searching the area and its back roads. The truck's bed had coins, but there were no other hints as to the missing man's location. A couple going fishing on Grand Lake, Oklahoma, then reported seeing a man's body floating in the water on October 11, 1989. The victim remained strapped with duct tape to a chair that was weighted with a block of concrete and a chain hoist, which was used to raise and lower bulky objects. In the victim's clothes, authorities discovered Dan Short's driver's license. Short's body was submerged using equipment that was flown to the FBI's forensic lab in Washington, D.C. However, five days following Short's robbery and kidnapping, the authorities were still at square one. A witness's tip that she had seen two men throwing something down the Kowsking Bridge helped to strengthen the case. A brown van with two colors was parked nearby. The van at Schwartz's house matched her description of the car. Investigators located Joe Agofsky, 23 years old, and his brother Shannon, 18 years old, thanks to another tip. According to witnesses, the siblings had been boasting about their wealth and their ability to steal a significant quantity of coins. Everybody had an alibi. Joe stated he was in Joplin, Missouri, around 40 miles away with his girlfriend. According to Shannon, he was with their mother. Since there was no evidence connecting the brothers to the crimes, they were free to leave. But that all changed when a man out fishing found a duct tape fragment on which there were obvious fingerprints. With great expectations, FBI officials sent the tape to the lab in Washington, D.C. The FBI verified that the tape fragment corresponded with the tape that was fastened to Schwartz's chair. However, none of the prints matched those in the FBI base. The absence of felony records among the suspects, according to the investigators, supported their initial suspicion that the bank heist was the work of amateurs. The chain hoist that was utilized in the crime proved crucial as the investigation went on. When a man approached, he said that the hoist was his and that he had left it behind in a rental house. The Agofsky family owned that house. Agents examined the boy's stories in detail. They discovered that Joe's older brother had misled them about his location on the day of the crimes after going through his phone records. After looking into the siblings' childhood, detectives discovered that the boys had a prosperous upbringing. When their father perished in an aircraft accident in 1980, money became a bigger necessity. According to a family acquaintance, they started running weapons in order to gain money. The friend said that Joe was the one who started it, but Shannon was glad to join in. Investigators discovered that the Agofsky brothers had been engaging in extravagant spending sprees after the Noel Bank burglary. The more the financial motivation for the crimes became apparent, the more suspicious the officials became. To prove their case, investigators required the Agofsky brothers' fingerprints. Joe complied, but Shannon refused. The prints from the older brother and the ones on the retrieved strip of duct tape matched, but not exactly. Shannon Nagovsky's fingerprints were identified as being on the duct tape by officials in March 1990. The fingerprints were the smoking gun. Almost three years after the kidnapping, robbery, and murder, in the fall of 1992, the brothers were charged and put on trial in Missouri. Joe Ogofsky, 26 at the time, and Shannon Ogofsky, 21 at the time, were found guilty of conspiracy, aggravated bank robbery, and using a firearm while committing a felony following a seven-day federal trial. They received a sentence of five years plus life in jail. The brothers were put on trial in an Oklahoma state court for the murder of Dan Short in 1997 following several postponements. While Joe Ogofsky was not found guilty by the jury, 
Shannon Ogovsky was found guilty. In 2004, Shannon was sentenced to death for the murder of another prisoner in a federal facility located in Beaumont, Texas. He is incarcerated in Terre Haute, Indiana, on death row. Joe Ogovsky died March 5, 2013. Ellen Billy Jerome, Missouri, 25 years on death row. Holder Norris, Missouri, 25 years on death row. A bank guard was shot and killed during a bank heist in Missouri by Billy Jerome Ellen and Norris Holder. Richard Heflin, a security guard, was slain on March 17, 1997 in St. Louis, Missouri during an armed robbery at the Lindell Bank and Trust. Holder frequently did business with Lindell Bank and Trust. A legal settlement Holder received after losing the lower part of one leg in a train accident was routinely paid into his account each month for $500, and Holder withdrew the money every time. Four days prior to the armed robbery on March 13, 1997, Holder went with Billy Jerome Allen for his regular monthly cash withdrawal. In the 10 days preceding the armed robbery, Allen and Holder were also spotted together multiple times. They viewed the films Heat and Set It Off, which showed armed bank robberies done in an assault-style takeover that was strikingly similar to the way they robbed the Lindell Bank and Trust later on. Holder was provided or he obtained a 12-gauge shotgun, two Russian SKS semi-automatic assault rifles, a Chinese SKS, about 200 rounds of ammunition, mostly military style, and a bulletproof vest that he wore in order to prepare for the armed robbery. Holder's mother's car was to be the third and final escape vehicle. Two vans were taken the night before the armed robbery and used as the first two getaway vehicles following the robbery. Billy Jerome Allen and Holder positioned the first getaway van on the roadway just outside the bank on March 17, 1997, the day of the armed robbery. They stormed into the bank with dark ski masks and carrying extra rounds of hollow point ammunition in addition to their semi-automatic rifles. Holder had the Russian SKS loaded with 37 rounds, and Allen had the Chinese SKS loaded with 11 rounds. The first person inside started shooting security guard Heflin right away. Holder then leaped over the counter and took money out of the teller's drawers while the robbery was going on. Both weapons were fired during the robbery, according to the ballistics data, and 16 rounds were fired inside the bank, at least 8 of which struck security guard Heflin, who passed away soon after. Three of the rounds were fired by the Russian SKS rifle, two were perhaps fired by either weapon, and 11 shots were fired by the Chinese SKS rifle. Within minutes of the armed robbery ending, Allen and Holder were back in the getaway vehicle, speeding away down the highway. The two males were seen by numerous witnesses leaving the bank and going back to the van. William Green, a bank customer, followed the vehicle onto the interstate and called 911 after hearing gunshots while at the drive-up teller window. As the van raced down the highway and into Forest Park, he kept up the pursuit. Green watched as the van caught fire as soon as it got into the park. The suspects drenched the van in gasoline before the armed robbery so that it would be simpler to erase the evidence when they got to their second getaway car. It appears that one of the suspects turned on a cigarette lighter, setting the van on fire. Alan, the passenger, leaped out of the van as it caught fire and fled into a rural area. Holder was on fire and two park rangers assisted in putting out the fire. At the same time, a policeman arrived on the scene and took Holder into custody. Bobby Harris, a city forestry employee, noticed Billy Jerome Allen shortly after he exited the van on the other side of the forested area. Allen fabricated an explanation for the burning of his head hair and persuaded Harris and another forestry worker to provide him with transportation to the closest Metrolink station. Billy Jerome Allen was subsequently recognized by Harris during a lineup and trial. The following morning, Allen was taken into custody at his girlfriend's apartment, where he had spent the previous evening watching the movie Set It Off with Holder prior to the bank heist. Please hit that subscribe button if you like my channel. See you next time. Bye-bye.